Hi, I'm John Sales. I'm at uh, uh, the NIAC Center. Um, we just presented Amigo to the Rivertown film series. Um, people are folding up the chairs. And uh, I hope you support this place and, and places like it. If you've got one near you, you're very lucky. If you don't, start one. Hi, I'm Susanna Styron. I live in Nyack. I'm a local filmmaker and a huge fan of John Thank Sales. You. All of my. <laughs> um, John needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, the uh, director of 17 films, uh, the writer of four novels, right, and a couple of collections of short stories. John is an incredibly eclectic and uh, fiercely independent filmmaker, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, that was a wonderful film. Um, I, I just want to ask a couple questions myself, and then I'm going to open it up to everyone else, because I'm sure there are lots of questions. Um, you have done several works of historical fiction, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, when you decide you want to do a film about Imperialism, or about uh, coal mine, about unionizing coal mines, or um, scandals, sports scandals. Um, how do you do choose what your story is going to be? What's what's going to be the best way to tell that story, and who your characters are going to be? Yeah, I, I think it's two things. One is that they're, they're generally things that I I know enough about to be interested in, but not so much that I'm not interested to learn more. Mm -hmm. So that the, the process of writing it, I have to do a lot of research. And, and it's not just the, the facts, it's, it's kind of, how could they have done that? You know, I remember being a kid and thinking about the, you know, how could you throw the World Series? You know, all these American kids who want to grow up to be baseball players and be in the World Series. Why would you throw it? How much money could they pay you? Um, and so part of how I got fascinated in that is knowing something about baseball, knowing a little bit about the history of the period. He's talking about eight men out. Eight men out, but also just trying to figure out what's the psychology involved there. You know, and, and a lot of the things, whether it's fiction or, or movies, come out of that, um, that, that question of, of people are acting this way, what can possibly be going through their minds? Um, and then the other, the other part of it is, is there a good story story there? So um, I was interested in American labor history and, and, and knew something about it, but um, until uh, I was hitchhiking around the country um, during a big fight within the United Mine Workers and, and coal miners were giving me rides and saying, well, it's pretty bad now, buddy, but you know, not as bad as the Maywan Massacre. Um, and I learned what the Maywan Massacre was, and I said, well, that's like a movie. You know, that's like a gunfight western. I mean, they literally end up shooting at each other at high noon on the main street of a little town. Um, so, so some of it is also just, you know, the, this big ass book over here is over uh, 900 pages, partly because I didn't have to make up any plot. Um, the plot was fascinating. I, I researched the details of it, and, and just more ideas would be would come because it was just such an interesting, not very well-known plot that I could hang these characters on and then, and then look into them. Um, and then I think the third thing that interests me with the historical stuff um, is, is this thing that when, you, when you, you, you write in a period, you can't just have the characters have the worldview and thoughts that we would today and put different costumes on it. You know, you have to ask these questions. Okay, is this before or after Freud? Um, is this before or after the women's movement? Is this before or after capitalism? Um, and then, you know, that goes right down to not just psychological stuff or worldview stuff, but, you know, is this before antibiotics? Is this before the pill? You know, all those things, without us thinking about it too much, really change the way, what thoughts are even gonna pop into your head? Um, so the, the, the two big events in uh, Moment in the Sun are the Philippine-American War, um, which is, is the kind of you know, beginning of America taking its first steps as an imperialist nation, 
and this racial coup that happened in, in um, North Carolina in 1898. And I realized I had these two really interesting stories and what's the connection besides something that I could drum up with having some of the, the soldiers who are from Wilmington, North Carolina end up in the Philippine War. And, and the connection is basically race. That, that all of the United States' uh, uh, excuses, if they wanted to call them that, or rationale for staying in the Philippines, for, for making war on the Filipinos and taking over the country, were racial. Um, the, that the, you know, the Rudyard Kipling poem, Pick Up the White Man's Burden, um, the subtitle of the poem is American in the Philippines, and it's this open letter to us saying that it's not just your opportunity, it's your white Christian duty to take over this country. And we Brits have been carrying the burden of, you know, imperialism too long. It's your turn. So, okay, so you have the whole Philippine-American War mm -hmm. to choose any part of it, any characters in it, and, and you chose to tell a very personal story that mm -hmm. sort of carried the, the burden of the history. Can you talk a little bit about how you create a person, how you find the personal thread and the emotional thread that makes it compelling to an audience? Yeah, I mean, you know, two things as a filmmaker, you know this, is, is that if you're going to get into any historical you know, period, you have to think about, well, how am I going to afford to shoot that? You know, um, so Amico um, has to do with some of the same things that A Moment in the Sun has to do with. Um, but being a movie, and I just can't write that the sun is shining and there's 3,000 people having a battle somewhere. I actually have to clothe them and feed them lunch and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, I decided that Amico would be uh, micro history and, and set on a village level. Um, but one, one thing that just jumped out at me when I was doing the research for a moment in the sun was this statistic that I read somewhere that hundreds if not thousands of these cabezas de barrio, these, these village mayors, were killed by one side or the other. And almost an equal number were killed by one side as the other. So there was this thing that had not even anything specifically to do with the Philippine-American conflict, but something that um, seemed ageless to me, that seemed like the good center of a story, which is this person who's stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, and I've often said that this is a movie that could, that could take place in Nazi-occupied France, or French-occupied Algeria, or Vietnam during the French, Japanese, or American occupation. Um, because the main character is a guy who wakes up in the morning and has to think, how much can I cooperate without collaborating, without being a traitor to my people and myself? And how much can I resist without getting myself killed, without getting my village burned down? And though the, that situation goes back to the beginning of time. Um, you know, the, the phrase that you hear in the movie, uh, we have to win their hearts and minds, that Chris Cooper's character says. I had always associated that with Vietnam, and I kept running into it in my research. There's Teddy Roosevelt saying it in 1900. Um, I traced it back to the Bible, you know. So this, this is, that's the other thing about, okay, what, what's the human situation that even if you just changed all the costumes in the era would still be there? So I felt like, okay, there's a, there's a great center to this. And the graphic for the movie, because I often, you know, make a graphic for a movie. Our, our movie, Make One, is a V, like, you know, most gunfight westerns where there's, you know, these, these kind of escalating, confrontations that lead to the big shootout. Um, this is a circuit, you know, and there's a guy in the middle of the circle and all the pressure from every side is coming on this guy and, and it's an untenable position. So, so it, it, it's, 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 yeah, with movies, almost always a combination of the very practical thing of what can I afford to do well, and then what's the human story that, um, can stand for a lot of other stuff, where we get enough of a taste of the Philippine-American conflict to understand you know, some of the bigger things. And, and it can't tell you as much as a 900-page book do, can do, or a real knowledge of the history, but it can give you a flavor of, of, of something of what it was like, which is that you, know, you had a lot of guys who, who especially the volunteer soldiers, because half of our soldiers over there were volunteer units, they signed up to free the Cuban people from terrible oppression by the Spaniards. Mm. 
and that war didn't last very long. And they got stuck on a boat, you know, out in San Francisco and ended up in the Philippines killing Filipinos. How did that happen? You know, um, I didn't sign up for that. Um, so, so and, and then on the Filipino side, there was this real, um, oh, I think difficulty in that um, they were, it's a country of hundreds of islands, it's a country of dozens of languages, and, you know, their technology, they didn't have that, um, that magic wire to connect each other. So any, the leadership which was on the run, which was being chased northward by, by General MacArthur, every once in a blue moon would get a runner down with a new decree, and by the time it got there, it probably made no sense anymore. The situation, the military situation, had changed. So, how do you run a war when you have your communication is that bad? You know, which is one of the reasons that the, you know, the telegraph wire is such an important thing in this movie, um, and that communication is such an important thing. So, even even the few attempts that the Americans take to communicate with the Filipinos who are Tagalog speaking. Um, there's this guy in between, this, this Spanish priest, who has his own agenda and doesn't always translate. You know? So it's like, oh, he's a telephone operator who's only gonna let certain words go through. Um, I have a sort of a two-pronged question and then I'm gonna open it up for, um, to, the, to the audience. Um, you, as I said, are such an eclectic filmmaker. I mean, the idea that someone who made this could also have made The Secret of Rowan Inish, I mean, the, the, the range is extraordinary, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, for one thing, um, do you seek to um, make very different types of films, or does, do, or just, do you just take whatever comes to you? And when you are making very different types of films, I know that you, you and Maggie always collaborate, and I think you, work very much with, for instance, Mason Daring, the composer, mm -hmm. and I know you edit your own films, but do you look for different collaborators who are more appropriate for the different styles of films that you're making? Yeah, um, the, the, the first part is, I, I think, you know, after you've just made a baseball movie, you're probably not gonna be that interested in making another sports movie right away, you know? <laughs> if I was ever to make another baseball movie, it would probably be um, uh, the great American novel, Philip Roth's book, which is only partly about baseball much more, you know, metaphoric. Um, so some of it is just, just one, but I've never gotten to make movies in the order that I've written them. You know, just, just you have to raise the money. And so Eight Men Out, for instance, was 11 years after I'd written the screenplay. Um, so as I always say, you know, I used to have this three by card with my dream cast on it. And I, I started with Martin Sheen at third base and ended up with Charlie Sheen in center field. <laughs> <laughs> so, Things happen, you know, that, that, so, so the trajectory is not a planned trajectory, it's what you can do. Um, and then as far as working with, you know, I'm always glad to, to kind of widen my own experience of collaborators. I mean, it is the great thing about filmmaking, which is, you know, as a novelist, some of my books I've had an editor and some of I haven't, but they really come kind of after the fact, and, and then you work with them a little bit. But really, you write a, a novel alone. When you're, you're making a movie, it's absolutely collaborative. Um, and the great thing about that is there's all these people who have skills that you don't have. You know, there are cinematographers and composers and actors who play parts that you can't play and costumers and, you know, all these esoteric skills are not so esoteric skills, but they can do it and you can't. But you say, okay, here's the general idea of what I want. No, bring me choices. Um, you know, as, as a director, you don't teach actors how to act you direct their talents, and that's what you do with anybody you collaborate with on a movie. Um, so it's nice to, to widen that, to have, to work with different cinematographers. And quite honestly, very often, you know, we may offer the cinematographer we just worked with our next movie, but they can't afford to work with for us anymore. You know, they've, they've got bills to pay, and we're still paying close to union scale. Um, and so they're just, you know, we, we, we've, uh, Stuart Driver, who shot our movie Lone Star for us, we've offered him three or four movies, and he always says, okay, here's the deal, is I have another offer, and they're looking for their money too, and whoever gets their money first, that's the movie I'll do. Mm -hmm. You know, and we've always been 
we could come in second with our, our fundraising or have never even raised the money for those movies. So that's some of it, is just who's available. Um, with casting, there are certainly actors who, whenever I finish writing a movie, I say, is there anything for David Scrivan, or is there anything for Chris Cooper, or some of the other actors that I've worked with? But other to you know, and, and I can't be sure that they'll be interested, available, or, you know, it will work out. But, um, you know, very often it's, it's, I didn't know any of these Filipino actors really by their work, except a little bit Bembo Rocco, who plays the one gorilla with a kind of bald head, who if you ever saw The Year of Living Dangerously, plays Mel Gibson's kind of Indonesian assistant, a wonderful actor. Um, and, uh, and Joel Torre, who's the lead, I knew personally more than I knew his work through Mario Antal, who was my uh, assistant editor and associate editor for years, um, who grew up with, with Joel. Um, but I, I think each time you, you really look for, we, almost, we always call it like the limbo bar, because it's like going to be a very low budget movie for the, the ambition of the movie. Who's, who's willing to go under the, you know, under the limbo bar? Who, who can, even though they're a cinematographer who the last time out made a 50 to 100 million dollar movie, can deal with the fact that they're going to have a very small lighting package and they're only going to have five weeks to shoot it. So the cinematographers who, who used to shoot five week movies with no budget, don't want to go back there or can't go back there or whatever. Um, sometimes it's okay, who are the crew people who are going to be fine working with kids, you know, and, the, and their personalities just may not work in that situation. So there's a little bit of that kind of handicapping that goes on. And then, you know, in the, in the case of this film, as we were shooting in the Philippines, they have a real film industry. Why bring Americans? Who we, A, have to pay for, and B, are, you know, too big for the beds. Um, <laughs> let's, you know, I've seen some really nice, you know, looking movies done there, and we got a great crew, great local crew, and we really only brought, as technicians, our, um, our sound recordist and boom operator because they don't shoot that many sync sound movies there. And they, they said, oh, you should bring your sound people. Um, and uh, it was actually very nice. Our, our cinematographer, Lee Mabe, um told her guys, okay, we're gonna be shooting live sound on this and you have to you know, treat these people specially. And it's the nicest I have ever seen a camera crew be to the sound crew. Because usually they just torture them. You know, they, they, oh, can we get you something? You know, they didn't want to bring their sound card over because it's expensive to, to fly it over. So they actually built them a sound card. They just gave them the specs on the computer and they built one themselves. And, oh, can we carry your sound card for you? So that was nice to see. Okay, who's got a question? What were some of the uh, difficulties that you had shooting this particular film? Um, as I said, they have a real film industry there. Um, one of our concerns at the beginning was the, the Philippine film industry, there's basically two big companies there, they make all the movies and all the TV, and, and if you're a mainstream actor, you kind of work for one of those corporations or the other. Their MO, because it's a, 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 a country with almost no unions, and the film industry with almost no unions, is that you sign a contract and you work a 24-hour day and then you get a, an unpaid day off, and then you come back and work another 24-hour, very disorganized day. Because very often the lead in your movie is doing a commercial in the morning and she's stuck in manila traffic, and so you're standing around, and that's part of how you fill the 24 hours up. But people don't get much sleep. Um, and the other thing is that um, they, when you get the equipment, you get people with the equipment. So one of the, the concerns that Maggie Renzi, the producer who's up in the balcony, and I had was that we're gonna have just too many people. Um, but what it, what it wasn't was a lot of people just sitting around doing nothing. In fact, yes, the equipment did come with people, but they also didn't just take care of the equipment when you were done with it, they helped set it up. They made lunch for their coworkers. They, you know, they were part of the team. Um, and, the, you know, pretty much everything costs about a third of it what, what it would in the United States. So we really didn't feel like we were carrying that many people. Um, the most specific problem I had, shooting sync sound, and we, were in a, we shot this on the island of Bohol, 
which is in the Visayas, which is kind of the middle belt of islands in the, the Philippine chain, which kind of runs um, north-south, was um, the, the biggest sport still in the Philippines is sabong, which is cockfighting. And a lot of people think that they're champion rooster racers. So there were a lot of roosters crowing in the, the village we shot in all day long. And we had to, to uh, send them on a vacation to a little <laughs> rooster condo that we set up uh, several miles away. And then um, we were having a problem with chainsaws because, you know, that's the one kind of power tool that people had out there. But chainsaws are licensed there, so we asked the mayor to, you know, tell us who the people were, and we paid them not to run their chainsaws while we were shooting. Um, so, and and the, the good thing was that people got used to shooting sound fairly quickly, um, so that they learned not to talk during it or make noises or, or, or whatever. Um, I had actually worked um, on a couple of my movies where people didn't speak English, the, the, the characters didn't speak English um, before. My Spanish is okay, so I can understand when, when it's Spanish, but in, in Men With Guns, there were a lot of indigenous languages, which I don't speak a word of. So I'd already done this thing of judging acting, including the auditions, by really paying attention to focus and energy, you know, and knowing basically what the scene was about, because I wrote it before it was translated. Um, but really honing in on, okay, why is this take moving me more or getting me more, you know, hooked on it um, than another take, and it's focus and energy. And then I would talk to my script supervisor who did speak to Gallag and say, okay, did they mess up any lines? Um, you know, and, and it's not a bad thing for a director to have to do um, is, is to, you know, hone in on just the, the, the physical rather than listening to every little word. Um, I also edited it without um, the subtitles being on it yet. Um, so I could just edit it for rhythm and performance. And then Mario Antal, my, my associate editor, who does speak Tagalog, although it's not his first language, he's from a different island. Um, he would listen very hard and say, oh, you've doubled the word there, something that I wouldn't have heard. So we would slide the cut a little bit. And actually, the one other problem was the, the two Chinese guys in it who were speaking Cantonese. I couldn't tell at first, having not worked with Cantonese actors, so I've seen a lot of their movies, if they were overacting or not. <laughs> because it's a musical language, it's tonal. And I was going to come over to them and, and say, maybe you can just kind of tone it down a little. And then I just saw them talking with each other, and I realized that's just the way they talk. You know, it's a tonal language, and it seems like they're singing. So um, that took a little bit of adjusting, you know, and, and just kind of picking off the, uh, an acting style, um, you know, and, and thinking, okay, this is not for the Cantonese audience, you know, is there an adjustment I have to make? And then it, they, they were just right. We, we did make a big mistake. We tried to, um, we couldn't find Cantonese speaking actors in the Philippines anymore. Most of the people there speak Fujian. Um, but, uh, we were trying to hire these actors kind of across the seas on computer through some casting directors in Hong Kong until, some, and we couldn't get anybody who wanted to do it. We, you know, the, the pay wasn't that bad compared to what they, they got at home. And then somebody said, you know, you're booking them for Chinese New Year. You know, this is the only week in the, in the year they get off. Nobody's gonna come to Bohol to, to work for you. So we moved their dates and we got some people ready. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we got a, a, a small local distributor um, in the Philippines to show the movie. Uh, they don't really have um, art houses there or places like this there. They have only kind of mall theaters now. So we got on some of those screens uh, and we were given the week in between Transformers and Harry Potter. Um, and we did okay in the screens that we were on in the, that week and then we were gone. Um, what's happened is it's been, uh, the uh, Minister of Education has endorsed it for, for high schools and colleges to put it in their curriculum and stuff. So it's having a same kind of, um, kind of slow diaspora within the country. Um, an interesting thing about this, and one of the reasons I got interested in this is, 
Once I ran into it, I was, I was um, working on my previous novel, Los Gusanos, which has to do with a long history between Cuba and the United States. And my research took me back to the Spanish-American War, and I kept running into this phrase, Philippine-American War, Philippine Insurrection, which I had never heard of. Not like, you know, I didn't take history classes or anything, but I figured, this seems like a fairly major war. Why haven't I heard of it? And then I started talking to some of my uh, Philippine-American friends and some Filipinos who said, you know, it wasn't taught in our schools either. Um, Joel Corey, who's about 50 now, I went to a very prestigious school on the island of Negros, and there it was taught. Um, the, we were colonized by the Spanish for 300 years, and then they sold us to the United States for $20 million and just left off this war that went on for 15, 16 years. You know, even though we declared mission accomplished after two, it kept going on just moving south within the islands. And we took over the educational system and did wonderful things in many ways with the educational system, but we designed the history curriculum and it didn't include the Philippine American War. So, so some of the reaction was um, an opportunity for the journalists to talk about this phenomenon which um, Filipinos are just, you know, catching up to. You know, some of their historians in the last 20 years have really been able to, you know, it's something I was able to take advantage of when I wrote um, the novel, is, is to find things that were written or family histories or whatever and bring up some of this suppressed um, history. Yeah, I think, I think it's something you always have to be aware of, which is, um, the, as I said, the story story has to be a good story. Um, and so in this, I just felt like, well, here's a great situation. Here's a guy who's, it's actually kind of melodrama. You know, his village has been occupied by these people. He's supposed to, you know, get them to fall in line. But his brother is, you know, just out in the woods there with the insurrectos, and he's got pressure from him to help them out. You know, where, where's his loyalty? You know, how is he going to survive this thing? And then his son has just joined the, the guerrillas. And, and what's his son think of him? Does his son think he's a traitor? Does his son think of, of what? Um, so, so just that human story is usually what I look for inside the bigger story. And obviously, as I said, th this is like a, a snapshot compared to what I would do in a huge novel or a mini series or whatever. And then you, but you know, there's there's a whole new branch of archaeology where people are like taking snapshots or, or you know still pictures that were taken on a you know Navajo reservation back in you know 1924 and going back and uh, asking the old people in the community, do you remember this thing? And they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, and they'll start to tell you all things about the thing from oh you see where the shadows on the ground that must be spring. Because the shadow would be in that, you know, things that a Westerner outside of that experience might not see. Um, well, what you try to do is get as much in the snapshot as possible without interrupting the flow of the story story. Um, and that's, you know, um, most movies, you know, most American movies anyway, um, use historic history as a, as a backdrop. Okay, you know, let's do Anna Karenina in the Old West. You know, it's been done. Um, you know, let's do the, you know, rape of Potiphar's wife in the Old West. It's been done. It's a very good Western named Jewel um, with Glenn Ford and Charles Bronson. Um, you know, but they're not that interested in the thing that I talked about before, how would people think? So it's why you see those movies where if it's the 60s, the, the girl is wearing like 60s makeup but, you know, whatever period, gown or whatever, with kind of 60s hairdo, you know, or they, they would make the untouchables, and the guys are all wearing Armani, you know, which, you look at the clothes from that period, they're really pretty awful looking, and so we just made the decision of, well, we don't want our stars to have to wear that shit, you know, let's get some Armani, you know, and, and it's a movie experience. So, I mean, a lot of this is just a choice that you make, 
But but it, it really does with me start of uh, okay, what are the actors gonna have to play? And they can't play the historical background. They have to play a, a human situation. Yeah, I, I, I work with an editor uh, on a couple movies, Make One um, and Eight Men Out, um, I can think of right away. I, I work with an editor, which was fun. I was always in the room at another machine and often, you know, I would do the, the montages while they were doing the straight cuts and then we'd switch seats. Um, I think because I started as a novelist and I write the first, second, and third draft of my stories, um, and then an editor really, editors are not writers, they're readers, and, and then they, they bounce ideas off about structure and stuff like that, but they don't actually sit down and, and do storytelling. Um, an editor is more like a storyteller, as far as I'm concerned. You, you can totally change the meaning of a movie. Think of what a documentary editor does. You know, you can come out on a totally different side and give it to two different editors with two different worldviews. And the same footage will turn into movies that say exactly the opposite thing. Um, so, so basically, I just realized I like editing. It's fun for me. I'm still working with the actors, even though they're gone. I'm shaping their performances. I'm still writing. Um, it's just easier for me to sit in a chair myself than, than to look over somebody's shoulder. Um, and, you know, I think, I think the... Um, the final thing is, it, it really is my favorite part of the process. You know, while, you, while you're writing a movie, especially me writing a movie for myself, there's always this big question mark of, am I ever gonna get to make this thing really honestly? You know, am I kidding myself? So it can really feel like kind of a sap while you're writing something. And I've written things that, you know, for instance, this book is based on a screenplay that I'll never get to make. You know, it's just nobody that's gonna give us the money to make that thing. Um, while you're shooting, you're, you are shooting, but you're worried about money. I always, I always figure, you know, a really noisy uh, cab driver's thing that's going ding, ding, every second, you know. And, and you can pretty much almost hear it in your head while you're shooting, you know. It's ding, ding, you know. Oh, we got to do another take. Oh, that's going to run us into meal penalty. Ding, you know. So there's that pressure. And we've often made more than one movie where the went back when we had other investors and not just our own money, the other investors are playing around and so you're worried about somebody behind you pulling the rug out from under you. While you're editing, it doesn't matter if the sun's out or if it's raining, you know, so you're not gonna not shoot that day because of some weather thing. You're gonna get to make the movie, you know, so you're not feeling like a sap, you know, and they're just not that money pressure. You know, you've got eight, 10 weeks or whatever you've got, and, you know, if you need to stay up late, you stay up late. So, so there's that nice thing of the security that this thing is actually going to happen, plus that, you know, there's still the fun of telling the story. I think the, the main difference between the American actors and the Philippine actors was numbers of trips to the bathroom. Um, the Americans all had uh, uh, the second or third day um, just some, you know, microbes they weren't used to. And, uh, uh, but every night they, they'd be sitting around telling war stories with each other. What was nice for the Filipino actors is that this is like the cream of the, the acting crop. These are people who do theater as well as movies and television. Uh, many of them had worked with each other over the years. Um, and they got to go home at night, go back to the hotel at night instead of working these ridiculous 24 hour days. Um, so they got to hang out and, and you know, with each other. Um, and drink San Miguel and tell stories. And then the American actors were kind of fascinated and made good friends with them. So yeah, they, 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 it really didn't break down into, you know, um, 
these guys and those guys, and you know, everybody's getting paid the same, which is pretty much scale, and, you know. Um, and because almost all the, the older Filipino actors anyway speak very good English, you know, there wasn't a, a language barrier. Can you think of any way in which this movie could have been any more depressing? Um, yeah, actually, um, the, uh, the colonel could have been in charge of the village instead of the lieutenant. So there, you know, there, there is this moment where they start to fraternize, where they start to actually see the other as somewhat human without really many words in common. Um, and the colonel's gone, you know, and then he comes back. When I write a biography for, for every character who has any lines in the movie. And um, one of the, the, the things that I talk to, um, uh, Garrett Dillon played the lieutenant, Chris Cooper, the, the colonel about is in their biographies and then just to them is, is the main difference between them is just generational. Uh, Chris's character is based on a real guy, um, hell roaring Jake Smith, who um, was put in charge of the island of Samar and among other things decided to decimate the male population. Uh, starting at the age of 10, any, any male capable of bearing arms um, over the 10, 10 years of age would just kind of kill him, turn, turn it into a howling wilderness was his idea. Um, and he's a guy who's a Civil War vet veteran, still had a bullet in his hip. He knows Chris is living, he read his biography. Um, he's seen, before he even got to the Philippines, thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, because some of the battles he's been at, dead and killed. Hanging one Filipino who may or may not be guilty of what he's doing is no big deal to him. Garrett's character has maybe seen a hundred people killed in a guerrilla war. You don't, you don't take that many casualties. He's still not blood simple. He's still relatively human um, and, and not inured to all this stuff. So yeah, you, you always have to think about that, um, which is even if it's even if the movie can't earn a happy ending, and I really don't care if a movie has a happy ending or a sad ending, it really is doesn't earn it on its way to that last scene. Um, is, is there the, are there is there any hope? And there is a little bit when the people you know start talking to each other. I think you know it, it's a it's kind of a long complicated dance between. United States and the Philippines, but we actually did, to, you know, we're good to our work and eventually said, okay, you're independent. Um, and I think one of the reasons we did that is the Japanese came and took over the island and Americans and Filipinos fought on the same side as, as guerrilla fighters as this. Um, the, the Bataan Death March, which you've probably heard of, and there were movies about it and everything, um, there were as many Filipinos on that march, both in uniform and not in uniform as there were Americans. And they were kept in a camp only a couple, you know, hundred yards away from the Americans' camp, were just as badly treated. Joel, the lead actor's father, was there. He survived it. Um, and I think there was a, a, a kind of new respect between the people that finally, I think, guilted the Americans and saying, you know, I guess we gotta give these guys what we told them we would, and, you know, good luck. Okay, one last question. Um, what's your next project that you're working on? You know, I, I make a living as a writer for hire and uh, as a screenwriter for hire, so, and I never know if any of those movies are going to get made. Um, the last two that I actually got paid for, um, I did one that may or may not get made. I, I think it's kind of a long shot, uh, based on a cool book called Girls Like Us, which is about um, Carly Simon, Carol King, and Joni Mitchell and their music and their lives in the 70s, which, yeah, um, would make a good movie, I think. Um, you'd have to get their permission, but they haven't even got to that point yet. Um, and then I, I've been writing a thing about um, uh, Sasha Litvinenko, who was a, a former KGB guy who was poisoned by the KGB after he'd been living in London for a couple of years with polonium, which is a form of radiation, a very terrible death, um, and, and kind of what happened to that tiny little opening that, that Russia had for democracy um, between Yeltsin and Putin, um, and just that it didn't work out, you know, that, that the oligarchs who kind of took over for a little while 
um, were just don't neoconservative. conservative. Oh, we can take all the money we want and it'll be good for everybody else. And then the, the KGB guys um, headed by Putin, um, who was kind of a non-entity at first, um, just took over and now they're running the country as a, you know, just like the Cheka and the you know, KGB used to run it during communism, you know, as their own little fiefdom. Um, so those are the things I'm working for other people on. Um, my own projects, I've written a thing, I got to know the Mirapol brothers who are the sons of um, Julius and Ethel, Ethel Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. And I've written a script based on that case that we're, we've been looking for money for a couple of years without much luck, but somebody's out there still looking for money for that. I wrote a movie that set, um, this is too eclectic, um, uh, during the uh, penal colony in Tasmania in 1820, um, <laughs> where you, you know, when they started importing uh, female prisoners, you could be um, assigned to somebody, even be married to them, but they were still basically your warden because your sentence wasn't over, so interesting kind of you know, social sexual kind of politics there. And then I'm writing something right now that's, um, you know, meant to be makeable for less than half a million dollars because that's the fallback position, and, you know. And then after we make that, if I, we get to make it, it'll be something that can be made for less than $50,000. <laughs> the arc of our budgets is definitely... Everybody's. Yeah. yeah. Well, you better get home. You have a lot of work to I do. I know. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you.